So we're going to go through a few slideshow presentations. So introduction to lighting. Oh, uh, just a quick safety review. Uh, don't drink or eat anything near the lighting equipment. Don't yank on any cords or cables. Um, normal clothing that you'd have in a theater. Um, just make sure, especially if you're doing lighting, not to have metal heels um, because, you know, metal conducts electricity and you don't want to get electrocuted or anything. Um, you know, no long dangly clothing, jewelry, no long hair. Um, remember your ladder safety, which just make sure that the ladder is on a, a level surface and you know, you don't, you have the three points of contact and everything. Um, and don't use metal ladders for the same reason that you don't want to use uh, metal shoes because that conducts electricity. Um, never handle electric or equipment when it's plugged in or has power running into it because that is, that is dangerous, um, especially if, or unless it's to focus it. Um, you should only handle equipment as you were taught to do. Um, I mean, we can't really explain. I mean, I don't have equipment in my house, so that's going to be a little weird online. But if, you know, if someone tells you to use a wrench as a wrench, don't use it as a hammer. That's, that's just sort of common sense. Um, we'll get in, I'll talk more about wrenches in Thailand later, but if you have a wrench, try and make sure, or make sure you have it attached to Thailand, which is a type of rope. And it's either attached to your wrist or your belt because especially when you're high up in the air if you drop a wrench you don't want it to drop all the way onto the floor onto someone's head because that that would be bad um and you should know where the fire extinguishers are um we had a, a bit of a, a problem with that last year we found like a fire extinguisher that was three years expired um so you need to make sure they're also not expired because if there's a fire and they're expired that, that's that's bad huh? okay so just a quick brief history of lighting. It started with sunlight, uh, which has been around since pretty much the beginning of time. Um, shows could only really be performed during the day, unless if it was, sometimes they like timed it up, you know, where you'd start at like uh, three and then it'd end with the sun setting, you know, and this is where you get like Greek amphitheaters and Roman amphitheaters and whatnot. And mirrors were sometimes used to reflect light, but that was more high tech. Um, and then around the 1400s, candles showed up, you know, they, they were useful, but a lot of theaters burnt down as a result of that, which was bad, but, you know, they didn't really have many other options. And that was the first time that theaters were really able to be done indoors. Um, and then around the 1780s, gas and oil was uh, made available for theaters. It was invented before then, but it wasn't really, like, widely enough used to put in theaters. And then in the 1880s, we have the lovely invention of electricity. Um, the first electric spotlight was invented in uh, 1903, and the ERS, which is the ellipsoidal reflector spotlight, which we'll talk about more later, um, which is basically the parent of the majority of lighting instruments we use today, uh, was invented in 1933 by the Klegel brothers. Um, and the purpose of lighting? Lighting is, is essential to any show you do. Like, even if it's not like super high-tech lighting, you need a light to see what the actors are doing. You know, you don't really need a set or costumes, but you're always going to need lighting. Um, you know, for, you need it for visibility, uh, tells the audience where to look and where not to look, um, and what's most important. So like, you know, if you're in a scene shift, you're not looking at you, the people walking around. You have the lights off, you know, or, or if you only have half the sh stage light out, you, you only look there. So, and it also reinforces the story. Um, it can tell a lot of stuff, like what time of day it is, even if that sort of stuff is subtle, it, it can give you a lot of information about the scene without you have to say like, oh, wow, it's a really bright noon day, you know, because that's, that's lame. Um, and it can also tell you the, lo tells the location of the action. Like I said earlier, you only light up like half the stage, you know, that's where the stuff's happening. Um, can also establish mood, you know, we'll get into more with design and stuff later, but it can give a, a, the tone or an emotion of the scene. Um, and it can also enhance the set. So, you know, it can add te texture or color to a set. You know, like if you have a blue screen and you put yellow light on it, you have a green screen um, or something. And it can highlight certain aspects of the set, you know, because if you're like, oh, this is a really pretty thing, put extra light on it. You know, all sorts of fun stuff. So the qualities of light. So this is basically like how you describe a light or and light as in the stuff that bright lights up stuff. So there's intensity, which is basically how bright a, the light is. Um, color, 
it's pretty it's what color it is um form form can be like the texture of a light i mean it, that's hard of like um we'll talk about it later but gobos um they can change like the shape it's basically the shape of a light and that can look like texture and it can look like a shape um and it's it's one of the qualities of light um direction is where it's coming from um, so if you're standing here, this is a direction of light, but then this is a different direction. Like if the, yeah, what, what direction it's coming from. And movement, um, some of the more advanced uh, lighting instruments, they can like physically move on their own. We don't have any of those at Lowell because they're too expensive. Um, but it's basically how light changes. It can be in any of the other qualities of color. It can change or qualities of light. Um, it can change in direction, color, intensity, from Q to Q. Um, so any sort of change. Okay, so here, intensity. You know, intensity is really important for showing what's most important in a scene. Because the human eye and brain or whatever, psychologically, will look at the brightest part on stage. And if you look at this from Wicked, you know, you're instantly looking up here. You know, because there's all sorts of brightness on there. Um, but there's also a lot of brightness here on uh, Glinda. So the first thing you're going to look at here is Alpha, and the second thing is Glinda. Third are the people here. And that also shows the importance of, of the people in the scene. So intensity shows, can help show that. And then here we have color. Um, color it can be used is probably one of the most important things in light design because it's, color is so deeply correlated with psychology. Um, so you see here there's like, um, complementary colors. There's blue down here and orange up here and sort of creates that contrast and whatnot and yes. So you know you can use color like blue is calming and whatnot. So bleh, I can't speak. Um, yes we will talk about color later or more in depth later. Um, form. So this is what I meant by texture. So you know, this, you could pretty quickly look at this and see, oh, this is probably underwater. You know, like if you're doing Little Mermaid or something. It gives you a lot of information about the, the location of this scene without having to say in the script, or they might say in the script as well, but like, oh, wow, it's really wet down here underwater. That's fun. You know, so it can give you a lot of information about the scene. And then this is also form. Um, you know, you can use shadows to create shapes that, you know, here it's trees, you know, you can show that there's, there's like some window in and through, there's the trees and everything. And it, it, it can also um, show location and various other symbolism and whatnot. So direct direction. Um, here, like there's, there's two different directions being used here. There's the dude here in like the, the God light. I don't know, he's just bathing in that light. And then the other people here, they have a bit of a side light going on. So they're much more like mysterious, like there's more shadows on them. They're like, you know, versus this guy who's just, he's, he's, he's living his best life here. Um, so that can tell like how you light a character can tell a lot about the character. This is from a dance show, but the same thing applies in theater. Okay, so types of lighting events. Um, I'm going to talk about all this. So this is theater, which is, which is most of what we do. Um, I'm just covering the other ones quickly in case we go back this year and, you know, you're in a dance concert or something. Um, so the main point of lighting is to enhance the story in, in theater and show the actors. So you need to make sure you can see their faces. That's, that's the biggest thing that directors will be annoyed at you about is if you can't see their faces. So here you can very clearly see this dude's face. Um, but lighting in theater can also be used for a lot of other things. It can be used to you know, like I said earlier, show the time of day, show the mood or the, the emotion of a scene. They can tell you where to look. Basically everything we just talked about. Um, with dance, the face isn't really as important. Like you don't need to see a dancer's face. You need to see their body. So, you know, here you can't see any of these people's faces, but you can see all of their bodies and how they're moving and whatnot. Um, shadows are also used a lot in dance because Shadows can give depth within the body, like side lights. If you have a side light, there's going to be shadows within the body and that can highlight the body because, I mean, dance is all about that. Um, and then here we have concerts. We have a bunch of concerts at Lowell just for the various orchestra and whatnot. Um, 
but generally speaking, you just, you just, there's, there's nothing fancy about it. You just need to make sure that the performers can see their sheet music, because if they can't, they, they're going to complain a lot. Um, yes. And then here we have an assembly. Um, the focus here is on the speaker right here. Um, and depending upon what the assembly is, the audience may or may not be in the dark. Here it's sort of halfway. Um, but that's another thing to keep in mind. And for events, uh, I think this is from a wedding, but the whole point of lighting and events is to create an atmosphere or a, a mood or a feeling. It's not so much like, I mean, you still want to not bump into stuff, but it's, it's not so much for visibility. Um, you're trying to make an experience for the, the patron, guest, whatever. Um, and then we come to arena, which is, it's just a spectacle. You know, there's not much, uh, symbolism or emotions behind this. It's just putting on a cool show for the, the people who are watching. We don't really have any sort of arena show at Lowell, but it's, it's fun to know. Okay, so the major players. So within the lighting department, what does, what does each person do? So the lighting designer is the person who works with the director um, and, and has the cons and com comes up with all the design elements of a show. Um, the assistant lighting designer, it depends on the person. Um, so, some places that they literally just do paperwork, some places they're very heavily involved in design. That's sort of fluid. Um, master electrician, uh, they, they do the technical aspect of the lighting design. So the lighting designer will come up with the design, give it to the master electrician, and they'll say, okay, I can turn this into reality. So, you know, figuring out where to plug in certain instruments, how to, how to manage to practically fit, carry out the design. And there is an assistant master electrician. And then deck electrician, uh, they're like the head of the light crew. And the light crew is a group of people, I mean, not necessarily a large group, that maintains, like during the show, they maintain, make sure all the lights have instruments, or all the instruments have lamps, sorry, um, and make sure nothing goes wrong. And before the show, they, they do most of the hanging, the focusing. Basically, they're the, they're the like muscle of the group they they do most they do that stuff and then the board operator during the show they're the ones who are clicking the go for e in between each queue um in smaller theaters a lot of the time the master electrician and the lighting designer are one and the same um and a lot of times they're also part of the light crew um this is just like in like a super like rich set like a high budget setting they would each have individual people for each part, but a lot of times those parts merge together and people do more than one thing. Um, okay, so basic tools. So here we have the adjustable sea wrench, which is the most beautiful tool in existence because it does so many things. Um, you know, you just, it, uh, the little thing here, you can adjust how wide it goes and you use it for so many things. Um, and, but you want to make sure, like I said, that uh, you tie a bit of rope around here and then tie it to your wrist or your your belt or something so that it doesn't, if you're high up, it doesn't fall and hit someone on the head because that would be bad. And we also have gloves because a lot of the lighting instruments are really hot. Um, so you don't want to burn yourself or anything. So you need to wear gloves and we have tons of gloves that you can use at Lowell. Uh, you don't have to buy, you don't have to buy your own anything for this ever. Um, and then ladders, you know, so you can, because a lot of the lights um, are really high up. <laughs> uh, I mean, some of them we can bring them down, but a lot of times you can't. Um, so you have a ladder for that. And you don't really use a screwdriver much, but you need it occasionally, you know, for unscrewing stuff. So mentioned. Um, so how it fits together. This is the part that confused me the most. So I'm gonna try and explain it as clearly as possible. So this is how it fits together. The, the practical, the, the technical side of the lighting instruments. So you have the instrument here which gets, which you plug into the circuit, which has a cord running to the dimmer pack, which has a, is part of the dimmer rack. And that gets power from the circuit breaker from the power source and is controlled by the lighting board. So we're gonna go over each of those things. So the instrument is the thing which produces the light and dictates it, its qualities. So it, it, so the, so the light is the thing that physically comes out of the instrument. It's, it's, the the light you see the instrument is the thing that manipulates the qualities of the light so you can focus it you can change the color with the instrument um the lamp 
is the piece of the instrument that creates the light, that uses the electricity to create the light. So you should never call it a light bulb. It is not a light bulb, it is a lamp. Um, and then electricity is the thing that powers the lamp. Uh, though that, those, two, those terms can sometimes get confused a lot. You can call an instrument a light, it's not. Um, the instrument can also be called sometimes the fixture or the units. Um, that sort of depends on where you're at, but at Lowell we call them instruments. Okay, so the circuit. Um, you have circuits in your house and wall plugs. Um, you know, we have circuits at Lowell as well. And they are what you plug the instrument into and then it receives power through there. So we have three different kinds of circuit locations. So there are single circuits, which you see here. Um, this is a twist lock circuit, which we'll talk more about the different types of uh, circuits. But so you can plug it into a single one. We have a lot of raceways, which are these things here. They're basically rows with a bunch of circuits attached along it, and you can plug a bunch of instruments in it. And we also have floor pockets, which we don't use at Lowell because they're all full of like dust and they're disgusting, but we have them. Um, and you can plug uh, instruments into there as well. And via cables, so a cable runs from the circuit all the way to the dimmers, which we're gonna talk about here. Um, so dimmers are like, you can think of them as like a dam. They, they control how much electricity gets let into the system. So, you know, like, so, if, if you say, I want 50% intensity, then the, the dimmer will only let in 50% electricity to that specific circuit and it will be lit, the instrument will be lit up at 50% intensity. Um, each dimmer, so, oops, uh, what has happened? Uh, okay, so um, this, each individual, like, I, like a, I, I, I don't know what cassettes look like, but I feel like this is what a cassette looks like. So each like individual cassette thing here is a dimmer and each dimmer corresponds to one individual circuit. Um, and each circuit is on a thing called a channel. Um, so one cir so each circuit is, so, so circuit one is on channel one and it corresponds to dimmer one. Circuit two is on channel two and corresponds to dimmer two. Um, when you get a bunch of these dimmers together, you get a dimmer pack here. So this is a dimmer pack, and when you stack up those dimmers on top of each other, you get a dimmer rack, like right here. Um, and then those dimmers are controlled by the light board. So here are the two light, the two light boards that we have at Lowell, the ETC Express and the Smart Fade. The Express is the one we have in the Carol Channing, and the Smart Fade is the one we have in the Steve Silver. Um, the Smart Fade isn't as good like it's 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 you have less control over the light system so they can control the intensity um and they're sometimes called the light console so they're the ones that say okay i want channel one at um 100 percent intensity and the dimmer says okay i'll do that and then it puts the light instrument on at 100 percent intensity um so just to review um the instrument is plugged into the circuit which goes through cables and is attached to a dimmer. And the dimmer is controlled, the dimmer is part of a dimmer rack, which is controlled by the light board. And the dimmer gets the, the, the source of power from, you know, landlines or whatever, and that's controlled by a circuit breaker. You don't need to know about this part, this is just fun. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the end of the first presentation. Okay, so lighting instruments and their parts. Um, give me a second. Okay, so we're just gonna talk about, this is sort of more about the technical side of lighting. So types of instruments. Um, so the source four. Um, source four is the most common uh, instrument that we have at Lowell. Um, also, by the way, you're gonna be getting the PDFs of all these lectures or slideshows or whatever. So you don't have to like quickly memorize anything. Um, so this is most of our, instruments at Lowell are their source fours or Parnells. Um, if you remember before I said um, ERS, there are ellipsoidal reflector spots. Um, the source four is a type of that. Um, the source four was invented by ETC, which is um, electronic theatrical controls or theater controls, which is um, one of the bigger lighting companies in around the 50s. Um, and after that, it's become the most like popular uh, type of ERS. The only other type of ERS I can think of is maybe like the Leco, but 
we don't use those at Lowell, so it's not important to know that. Um, so it has a beam of, of, so the source 4 has a beam of light that can be focused or, and sharpened or blurred and washed. So if something's like really sharp, we call that focused. And if something's like really blurred, we call that a wash. Um, so gobos can be put in like right here, um, which are the things I showed you earlier of the shadows um, from the trees uh, and gels, which is, we're gonna talk about both these later, but gels are like colored pieces of plastic that um, let you change the color of the light. Um, and shutters, I'm talking about a lot of the parts of the instrument. We're gonna talk about the parts later. So the, the shutters are these things and they help you change the shape of the light and the degree of the barrel can be changed by, or the, yeah, the degree of the barrel, can, the lens can be, bleh, can be uh, switched out by changing the barrel, which we're gonna talk about barrels later. Um, and these are mostly in the Carol Channing. And then we have the Source 4 Junior, which is also a type of ERS. The Source 4 Junior is like the kid brother of the Source 4. Um, it's basically a Source 4, but it does not have a gobo slot and it's not as bright as the regular Source 4. So it's a bit more limited in its capabilities, but um, you can still use gels, shutters, and manipulate different, or use different lenses to manipulate the light. And these are mostly in the Steve Silver Theater, which is our smaller theater. Um, and you know, it's a little, it's a little cute boy, you know? Okay, here we have the Parnell. This is the second most common instrument that we have at Lowell. Um, the Parnell is like the bastard child of the Fresnel and the Parcan. Uh, well, I'll mention those two like right after this. But normally these are used to create a wash, um, but the lens can be rotated. Um, the lens right here, it can be rotated a little to uh, focus or just uh, focus the light a little. Um, gels can be used, uh, barn doors, which I mean, <laughs> I keep saying I'll talk about it later, but I will. Um, and they can also like change, they're basically like shutters for Parnells. Um, and it uses the same type of lamp as the source for, which is useful. Um, so the, the Parnell has a Fresnel lens in here, which it gets from the Fresnel light or instrument, and it has the body of a park cam. So here is a Fresnel. You can see the, the lens that was in the Parnell here. Um, this is it also up close here. Um, the interesting thing about par or Fresnel lens is they were originally made for lighthouses. Um, and in the center here, you have a flat disc. And as you go along, the ridges become more and more steep, I guess. So at the edge, they're like very steep, but then closer, they're like more flat. Um, pretty much all of the Fresnels we have at Lowell are in the Steve Silver. We only have a couple. Um, and Yes, so there's the construct bleh, concentric circles. And because of the concentric circles, they actually make a really good, nice, soft wash. Um, uh, which, maybe I'll let stop. Um, sorry. Uh, and these can be gelled, which, you know, ch so that you can change the color of this. Um, and the focus of this, like what, how, uh, how focused it is um, can be changed by moving the lamp inside of it closer or further away from the lens. And here we have the Parcan, which is the other parent of the Parnell. Uh, we don't have any Parcans at Lowell, but it's, it's just mentioned because um, it's, it's the other parent of the Parnell. And who knows, you may need to know what a Parcan is at some point. Um, so this is a strip light. Uh, we have about five at Lowell. Normally they go along the bottom of the psych, which if you haven't been in the theater yet, you don't know, but it's a giant, the psych is like a giant white screen at the back of the theater. And you put these strip lights underneath it near the bottom and they can light up the, the, the big white screen with different colors. Um, so yeah, they, they use like the RBG, you know, red, green, blue. Um, they use those three colors in different combinations to create different colors on the psych. Um, and they can't, we pretty much only use them for the psych, but they can be used in different areas of the set and for whatever. And the gels um, can be, you can switch out different colors of gels to create different colors, but normally it's just uh, red, green, blue. Uh, rondelle lenses can also be used. We have a couple of those. These here are actually rondelle lenses. 
they're called the rondelle because they're round it's very creative uh naming um but they they can be exchanged instead of uh gels we have a bunch of those at Lowell as well uh, these are psych lights. They're different from strip lights. Strip lights uh, are on the ground. Psych lights are in the, in the sky. Um, so they're hung from the ceiling, or not the ceiling, sorry, <laughs> from pipes in the rafter area. Uh, we have about five of these at Lowell. Yeah, they are similar to psych li or strip lights, but they're in the air. They're usually more powerful than strip lights, like they, they have a brighter light. Um, and they use a different lamp from most other instruments that we'll talk about later. Um, so this is the follow spot. Um, we have about we have two of these at Lowell, one on either side of the the light booth. Um, so this is about person height. Like this is about like if I'm standing next to a, a a follow spot, this is about where I am. I mean I'm a bit shorter, but you know it, that's that's about how big it is. Um, it's operated manually by a person, so you know you'd grab the handle here and just rotate it around. Um, they follow around an actor, so you can like boop, 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 boop. Um, so this is normally used when the actor either goes off stage because we don't really have any lights to light up off stage, or if there just isn't a light in the right place. So you just, it's like a free form light, you know. Um, these colored sticks here, they give you a limited ability to change the color. So if you press down the red, it'll turn red. Um, ours are just a, a tiny bit uh, broken, but they still work well enough. Um, uh, don't ever look directly in this. It's, it's super bright. Don't look into it. It's, it's painful. Just, just don't do it. Um, yeah, that, that's, don't look into it. Um, scoop light. We have a two at Lowell. They don't, these are pretty much the only lights that don't have a lens. This, this is just, it's, it's open. You could stick your hand in there and it's fine. There's, I mean, it'd be really hot, so don't, but you know. So there's a lamp in here and this is all inside just like mirror reflective surface. So the light bounces off of each other and gets bright and it helps amplify the light as it goes, sorry, as it, as it goes out. Um, these are almost never used during a show. They're normally used as work lights or backstage lights, so you can see what you're doing backstage, but they're not used on stage. They're an off-stage light for the most part. Um, and normally you put blue gel on it to make it a little uh, less bright, you know, because you don't need like um, super bright lights. So LED lights. Um, we don't have any at Lowell, unfortunately, because it's sad, but um, they, can, they can change their color from Q to Q automatically without the help of gels. And they're just, they're just pretty snazzy. They're, they're cool. Um, yeah, but we don't have any wool. Okay, so parts of an instrument. Okay, so this looks complicated, but it's, it's really not. So this is the source four we saw earlier. You can think of it in four sections. There is the barrel, the barrel house. So the barrel goes inside the barrel house. That's why it's called the barrel house. And then here you have the burn base. And then this is the reflector house, but you don't really need to know about the reflector house. It's not super important. So the burn base, um, you can remember burn base because there's the lamp in there. So when you touch it, you're going to burn yourself, um, unless if you have gloves. So that's why it's, it's, it's the burn base. And the barrel, it's, it's a barrel shape. I don't know how to remember that other than that. Um, the pigtail here, that's the cord. So you have the cord that plugs into the burn base and you plug that cord into the circuit and that is how you get your electricity. Um, we're going to talk about each of these individual parts um, in a second, um, but this is just how they all fit together. And like I said, you're going to get um, a copy of all these things, so you can look over it yourself again. Um, so this is the Parnell. Um, it's a little more, it's a, it's a smaller instrument. Um, so the, it just has the barrel, and then there's two lenses, which is different from the Source 4. And this is what its burn base looks like. It looks a little different, um, but it, it does the same thing. And don't touch it because you'll burn yourself. Um, so clamps. So as you can see here, there's, they don't show it here, but the clamp goes in here in this little hole and it, it attaches there. Um, but the clamp, so we, there are two types of clamps that we have at Lowell, the C clamp and the O clamp. We pretty much don't ever use the O clamp because our, our pipes are, 
sort of janky and the the oak clamps don't fit around them they're they're too big um normally oak clamps would be better though because they put less stress on the pipe um and that overall it will the pipe will get damaged less because you know with the c-clamp what you do is the pipe goes in here in this little circle part and you basically just jam this uh bolt in here into the pipe and over time that can uh damage the integrity of the pipe so that's why the clamp would be better but we use c clamps because we have to um but yeah oops okay so this is parts of a c clamp um so this here is the body it's it's sort of looks like a handle um and here we have the pipe bolt because it physically touches the pipe that's why it's called that um and here is the pan screw um, so the pan is, um, when you have an instrument, it's how it, it moves side to side. That's the pan. And if you loosen this, you can change the pan. That's why it's called the pan screw. And this thing here is the spigot. So it's, it's I don't know, it's just called the spigot. Um, and this is the yoke bolt, which attaches to the yoke, which um, is, is this thing here. That is the yoke. Um, yeah, so that's the parts of a C-clamp. The yoke, like I said earlier, it's this sort of, I mean, I don't know how, like it's a, it's a cup almost shaped thing. Um, and it's called the yoke. And it connects to the C-clamp here. And the knob at the side here called the yoke, the yoke bolt, if you loosen that, um, so the instrument goes in here, like in here, it sort of hugs the instrument. If you loosen this, you can change the tilt of the instrument. So that's whether it goes up and down. So that's Im important to remember for when you're focusing. Barrels, okay. So this is where the lenses are. The lenses are inside the barrels. Um, and the degree of the barrel is, change, is um, basically the, the size of the beam, which I'll talk about later. Um, but most of the barrels that, that we have at Lowell are um, 36 degree, 26 degree, or 19 degree, but we have a few uh, five degree. So this is like a 19 degree here, you know, and it looks like a normal, the 32 and the 26 look pretty much the same as the 19, but then we have the five degree here, which is like a very, very, it's just very large because it has to go a lot farther. Um, and if you see here, this is sort of, you don't really need to know this, but it's, I think it's interesting. Um, so the, you, here you have the 36, the 26, and the 19. It's basically, if you have the barrel, the degree is the degree of the, the beam. So if the beam comes out and it's this big, the degree of that angle of the beam is the degree of the barrel. So the five degree, bar the five degree barrel creates a very thin um, beam of light, but it goes a lot farther. So we have those in the very back of the theater. But then the 36 one, it's, it has a bit, is, the beam is a lot wider. And we have those right on the stage. Um, so that's, that's what the barrel degree means. Um, yes. So the burn base. Um, that's the part that holds the lamp. And like I said, it is very, it can heat up very quickly and it's very hot. So always use gloves when you're touching a burn base. Even if you already unplugged it, it still takes a while to, um, cool down. And this is what a Source 4 one looks like, but like I said, the Parnell ones look a little different. Um, okay, so connectors. We generally use three different connectors at Lowell, um, and these are connected to the pigtails, which are just cables that come out from here. Um, so this here, this is an Edison connector. It's, it's the kind, it's your wall plug, you know, everyone has an Edison connectors in their home pretty much. Um, this is a stage pin. We typically only use these in the Steve, or no, we only use these in the Steve Silver. Um, and they have three pins. And then here we have the twist lock. We only use these in the uh, Carol Channing. And the thing with these is you plug them in and then twist them. Um, it's a bit hard to see in this picture, but there's a bit of a knob. So if you try and yank this out, you're going to break it. So you need to always make sure that you're taking out a connector properly, especially if it's twist lock, because you don't want to break it and you should never yank cords. Um, so generally, or not gen just in the, so connectors have two ends, the female end and the male end. Um, the male end is, these are all male ends. They are the ones with the things that stick out. And then the female end is the one with the hole. 
Um, yes. So if, if you want to ask for a specific connector, you have to say, oh, I want a mail end Edison or something. Um, and then lenses. So these are different types of lenses. Um, this here is a Fresnel lens we talked about earlier. This is just sort of a smooth source four lens. These two are, could be used in a Parnell. Um, and they, they, um, they help reflect and magnify and focus the light coming out of the lamp. Um, different shaped light lenses can produce different light. Like, um, you know, the Fresnel lens creates a really good wash, whereas the, the source four can make a really sharp focused light. Um, and in the source four, it can be used, moved back and forth. Um, so if the light is here, you can move it back and forth to create a fo either a focus or a wash. And in the Parnell, it can be rotated. Okay, so lamps. So this thing here, this is, this is a beautiful thing right here. This is the HPL lamp. It's, it stands for high performance lamp. Um, at least like a fourth of our budgets every year goes to this thing. Um, they light up source fours and Parnells. Um, it's a halogen lamp, which is just what type of lamp it is. Um, so you, you, you should know what these are. Um, don't ever touch an HPL, like with your fingers, because um, the chemical like oils or whatever on your fingers, if you touch the glass part of an HPL and then you plug it in, it'll explode. So if you do touch it, it's okay. You just need to let someone know because then we can clean it properly. But if you touch it or get a fingerprint or any sort of touching of the glass here, oops, um, any sort of the glass here, then that is gonna be really bad because if you, if you put it in an instrument and plug it in, it will explode. Um, and we don't want that. So um, yeah, lamps are the source of the light. Um, so lamps do burn out after a certain, certain amount of time they need to be replaced. Um, which is why we spend so much money on HPLs, because we have to constantly replace them. So um, psych and strip lights have different lamps from everything else. They have these long tube things. Um, and this, these things are the things we use in this, the follow spots. They're really powerful, but also like this big. Um, so they're called overhead projector lights. They're also used in the projector. Um, so gels and gel frames. So like I said, they're like thin pieces of plastic that you put in front of a light and it changes the color. Uh, it's pretty simple. So you put the gel inside of the gel frame here because if you put a thin piece of plastic in front of a thing, it's just gonna fall down. You don't wanna like, and if you were to tape it on, you know, the tape comes out. So you just slot it into here and then the, the instruments have a slot to put the gel frame inside. Blah. Um, there are indexes like Roscoe and a bunch of others that we have that can help you identify the, because each gel has a code number, they can help you identify the code number of each gel. Uh, gels are used to add, add color, change mood of a scene, and they can help with design. So, you know, if you get out your little like Roscoe thing, you find a color you like and then you order it and then you have some gels in that color. Okay, so gobos. I talked about this a few times before and they are super cool. Um, so what you, a gobo is essentially, for the most part, a steel disc that has holes etched out in it. So here you see like this, this, there's these holes for these snowflakes. And then in action, you see here, there are snowflakes, you know, so that can be used. I mean, this is a little tacky here because, you know, snowflakes, um, but it can be used in a lot of ways, like to make trees. It can just do texture in general. Um, it can do all sorts of cool things. Normally it's used to set the uh, help show the environment of a set, but it can also be used for symbolic purposes. You know, if you have like a, a star and your character wants to be a star, you know, you can have a star in the background or something. I don't know. Um, so they can be pretty much anything you can think of, you know, because you can, I mean, it's just a steel disc with holes in it. You know, it, anything that you can think of can be done. Um, there are other types of gobos like glass gobos and prismatic go gobos. We don't have those at all. We only have steel gobos. Um, and because of the way the light is reflected through the instrument, you need to put the gobo upside down and backwards. Um, so when you put it in, it reflect, it's like bound, it's mirrored and whatnot, and it comes out the right way out. But you need to make sure you put it upside down and backwards. Um, and here's the shutter, which I showed you earlier. Um, the source four has four shutters. And they're basically steel plates. And you can 
um, they're sort of used to chop off the light. I mean, it's sort of hard to explain without showing it, but um, you know, normally your light beam is a circle, but if you have a shutter, you can like close off part of it so that it's a rectangle or a square or a diamond or anything like that. Um, and yeah, it can use, um, be used to make simple objects like squares or diamonds. Um, and it can be used to create smaller beams. So if, you're, if your beam of light is, is like really big, but you want it to be small, use the shutters to make it a little smaller. Um, and when you're using shutters, the same thing with gobos, um, everything's reversed. So if you move the top shutter, the bottom of the light will be cut off. If you move the right shutter, the left of the light will be cut off. Um, barn doors. So these are used on Parnells. So shutters are for source fours and barn doors are for Parnells. So you put this in front of the, the Parnell and you can just use like change these, these like doors to change the focus of the light or change the shape of the light, sorry. Um, yes. Okay, so knots. This is my, everyone's least favorite part, but basically um, knots is an important part of tech and it's normally lumped in with lighting. Um, so you have the clove hitch knot. I put links at the end of the video of how to do each of these knots so you don't need to like freak out and copy everything now. So basically, I'm gonna try and do a an, um, speaker here. So you have your rope and you wrap it around the object and you wanna make a, an X here. Ugh. This is not a good way to show this, but there's the YouTube videos. You can watch those. I'm just trying to show these anyway. So you have the, you make an X here and then you put it through here. Yes, okay. You know what, this is not showing up well on Zoom. So you can just watch those YouTube videos. Um, oops. And uh, when we post this lecture on our YouTube channel, we'll put the links to the videos in the, um, in the description so you can find them there as well. Yeah. Um, so the top part, the top um, instructions are more of a technical definition. And the bottom here is supposed to be more pneumatic, like uh, to help you remember it, you know, it's easier to remember make an X thread through the X than it is thread object through last loop, you know, so. And same thing with here, the half hitch. Um, and then there's the bowline knot, which is, I mean, you're gonna suffer doing this, it's hard. Um, I kind of have to, have to explain this pneumatic because uh, bunny hole and whatnot. So um, you make the little loop here, which you call a bunny hole. And then the end of your rope is a bunny. And you put it through the hole and then around this end, which is a tree apparently now, and then it goes around that and back through the hole. And then you have a bowline knot. That, I messed that one up, but you know, it, it, it'll work. Um, so yeah, so here are the, also, um, I don't really have um, the equipment of light, like the physical instruments at home. So I can't really show you how to hang or focus an instrument. And even if I could, it'd be so abstract that I'd have to reteach you when you got back to school. So there are these, there are a couple videos here of people who have the actual instruments and they can talk about it. It's not required to watch any of these videos. These are just optional. Um, I'm still gonna have, probably have to teach you how to do it once we get back. Um, but this is if you wanna get ahead. And then here are videos of some more in-depth stuff about all this stuff, a few things that I talked about. None of this is stuff that you're probably going to need to know, but it's, if you're interested, it's nice to know about like gobos and whatnot. Um, and then that brings us to our last, oops, thing. So this is design and lighting. This is gonna uh, most be the most important thing for your project because for your project, you're gonna be talking about design choices um, in a musical number for a theater. So what does design do? We talked about this a little earlier, but it can set the mood and tone of a, a, sh of a show um, uh, and for of a show overall and for each individual scene. Um, it can tell you the time, of, the time of day, the place, it can tell you where the audience has to look or focus and it can enhance the story just overall. Okay, so the technical, okay. So the technical side of design. This is more just paperwork. Um, so cue sheets, um, if you're, I mean, yeah. So cue sheets are a normal part of lighting. Um, all through for a lot of pretty much every department has a cue sheet. So, you know, you'll have this is the cue sheet we had for no exit. So you know you have like the page number, 
for that show, we had to have memories because it was a different board. You know, cue, the go, description, and everything. Um, and then another part you have to do is the lighting plot, which here there's a ton of instruments. Um, and this shows where each instrument is placed and where it's plugged into. This is the light plot for the Steve Silver. Um, and it shows where each instrument is. You know, we have Parnells here and Source 4s and Sykes. And we know where each of them is plugged in. So when we go to the board, we know how to do that. And then we have magic sheet. There's a few different types of magic sheets. Everyone does them a little differently. So, you know, it's, it's normally used really closely with the light plot, but this is the one we have for the Steve Silver. So, you know, if we're like, oh, we want something, uh, a light, we just really quickly need to light up upstage right. We go here, upstage right, and these are all the different instruments that are pointed at upstage right. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. So um, for your project, you're going to be looking at finding at, like talking about design choices. So this is what to look for. Um, so these are some questions to ask yourself when you're looking at some design for lighting. Um, what emotion does it make you feel? Or what emotion does the, or bleh, what emotion does the designer want you to feel? Um, and colors are a big part of that because colors are really deeply ingrained in your subconscious psychology and everything. And designers very much research that and know like, oh, blue is calming. So the, the, the big fight scene should not be in blue. <laughs> I mean, unless if you're trying to subvert expectation or something. But anyway, how does it enhance the physical environment of the play? So how does it, yeah, do just that, enhance the physical environment of the play? It can either be in, in enhancing a set piece by putting some texture on it or a color, or it can be g giving you information about the setting, like the time of day, the location, anything like that. Um, what sorts of, uh, sorry, what themes or messages might the designer be trying to showcase and how does it relate to the bigger picture in the show? So you're not gonna be watching an entire show, you're just gonna be watching one piece, um, but you can figure out like probably a few, a couple themes like, oh, maybe they're lonely or maybe they're really happy, you know, those can be themes and how you're trying to figure out how the designer is trying to show that. And it depends on the show, how they do it. Um, so how are different characters presented? So, you know, like if you have an evil character, they might be shrouded and they don't have as much light or maybe they have a red light, but then the hero has really like strong light, bright light. Um, or, you know, they might switch those around to purposely mess with you. So how, are, how is the designer trying to manipulate your perception of the characters? And the real question is, how does the design create those answers to those questions? Um, so if you're feeling sad when watching a scene, how does the design make you feel sad in addition to the scene itself? Okay, so the qualities of light, which I talked about earlier. So color, um, I, I put a video, so if you don't know color theory, which is just basically like, how different colors look good together. Um, you, I mean, it's, it's, you don't really need to know that, but there's going to be a video that you can watch if you don't know that. Um, so white pretty much goes with every color. Um, and here we have um, two examples of red and white being used together. They're kind of different moods. Um, this is mostly creates the different mood because of the body posture or the body language. But here, you know, uh, red tends to make like a more alert um, attention um, and white. So, you know, if it was just pure red here, it'd, you'd sense it'd be like danger, you know, but since there's the white that sort of neutralize it a little. So it's more of an alert tone than a dangerous tone. So, you know, they don't, the, you're that. Um, even if they hadn't said any lines yet, if you didn't know what was happening, just seeing the lighting, you already know what sort of scene to expect in that case. And then contrast th that, what you saw there with this, with the blue light, which is a lot calmer. And see here, it's definitely a much sadder scene um, because there's blue, it's probably nighttime. The way that they have these lights hung up can look like stars, or at least I assume it's meant to look like that. Um, and you know, it's nighttime and it's blue and it's calm. And it's a lot calmer than this alert someone, I don't know, making a stand or I don't know what show it's from, but it's, it's definitely really different. And the biggest difference is the color in that, in that example. 
Okay, so use of form or texture or shape. So here you have the one that I, I talked about earlier. Um, it's, it's a different, it's textured. So it looks like it's underwater. So that gives you a lot of information about where it is. Um, and then here you have like, uh, so this is like just a, a plain column. Those like blue symbols, that's all made from light. So that's, that can show, like if you're changing that from scene to scene, it can really help, you know, to help the audience know where they are and where that's changing. And that's, this is that show specific, but that can be used in any show. And here as well, these are just um, pieces of metal and whatnot, and the light is pro projected on them. Like you see here, um, since it's shaped a certain way, when the light hits it, it changes how it looks because the shadows. Um, so yeah. And this isn't a quality of light, but I wanted to talk about shadows real quick because shadows, like the absence of light is just as important as light itself in design. Um, like here, you know, this shows a very, very specific feeling. You know, she's being surrounded by these hands that you can't see. And you could have like actors physically put their hands out, but the fact that you're using the shadow shows a very different mood. And here as well, you know, you're sort of showing a scene that's not seen. <laughs> Um, like it's, it's shadow, it's memory, and there's all sorts of things that you can use in design or see um, through shadows. And then this is also how shadows can be used. This is a dance performance. You can see the shadows on the body are really dramatic. You know, like if they just had like a straight fluorescent light right in their faces, it would not be as elegant as it is with these shadows, you know. So seeing like how those shadows are used to enhance the physical body, the physical um, uh, set pieces, like I was showing earlier, is really important to design, just making things look good. Um, intensity. So here, it's a pretty, this is a pretty ominous looking place, you know, um, and contrast that to this photo where it's, it's a lot more welcoming. And the only thing that has changed here, nothing has changed except for the intensity of the light. You know, the, the intensity here is a lot brighter up here and this is all silhouetted, so it makes it look all mysterious. But here it's a little less bright here and it's a lot brighter here. So, you know, there's not that silhouetted mysteriousness. It's just made it seem a lot friendlier, I guess. Um, and it, it helped, oops, and it has you focus instead of on these columns, on the, the furniture, which is nice and comfy and whatnot. Um, so direction. Direction is, tells a lot about the character that is being, has the direction on it. You know, like we were looking at this photo earlier, you know, there's this person here. He's obviously like going through some emotional thing or some like, he, I don't know, he's the chosen one, you know, and these people are sort of more in the background. So you see, obviously, this person is more significant, um, at least in the context of the show. And this person here, you know, you're getting this backlighting, which is very dramatic, and also shows some sort of like, like almost like supernatural ethereal thing, because they're like, uh, you know, it's, it's showing some weird thing here. I don't know the show exactly this, but like the context of this, but it feels like some sort of like, I don't know, memory or something, symbolic thing, you know. Okay, so other options in design. So these are other things to look out for aside from the qualities of color. So I don't think any, you know, black light is used sometimes. Um, most of the time it's used as a novelty sort of thing, um, but it can also be used interestingly for design. Um, and projections. Um, projections are, I mean, we're never, we're, okay, so we're never going to be doing projections at Lowell again because we did that with Sweeney Todd and it was it was a nightmare, but um, they're still cool to know about. Um, so all of these pictures here, these are all the same exact set. Like the background here, all of these things, they are all projected onto there. Um, projections, at least in like high budget um, productions, are becoming their own department uh, separate from lighting, uh, but currently they're still considered lighting. Um, and, you know, you can do all sorts, you can go, it changes the way that set design is done because, you know, um, you don't need as much of a set if you can project stuff. 
Um, okay, so strobe lights. These are normally used for like slow motion scenes. They can be used for dramatic scenes or for dramatic effect. Um, you need to make sure to put an epileptic warning because you don't want to you don't want to put anyone through a seizure. That's not that's not nice. Um, and they can be used for all sorts of creative uses. So, um, one second. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. No, I'm set up. Okay. So, types of design. This is a very broad. Um, not a complete list. So there's, generally speaking, minimalism, realism, surrealism, abstractism, symbolism. I need to get rid of that slash surrealism. Um, <laughs> flashiness and fantasy. But most designs are a combination of some sort of combination of those. So here we have minimalism. It's, this is normally low budget. It's not always low budget, but it, it typically is. You know, there's like, there's one light and it's on or it's off. Um, this is, I mean, it's not always that minimalistic, but it's, it's pretty simple. Um, realism. A lot of times people confuse realism with minimalism, but it's really not. Like here, this is a very realistic lighting set, um, but there's, it's really complicated. You know, inside you have these warm lights, you have these um, lamps that are plugged in, you know, outside you have shadows of tree leaves, you have a cooler color out here, and then you have this back thing lit up. Um, being able to figure out what type of design or lighting design concept you have um, is important to find design choices. For like for realism, the main goal is to enhance the physical environment of the set. Um, abstract. So I don't. I'm I'm pretty sure this one's from an Arto play, which is why it's it's it, it's very abstract. You know, abstractism. The main goal is to show the phys the emotion of the character or the scene. They're not at all concerned with being realistic, you know, so this is a sort of like projection uh, disco disco ball type thing and it's all centered around this one person. So, you know, there's nowhere in the real world where you would ever see anything like this, you know, and this is really extreme abstract abstractism, but the point is to show the emotion, not the physical environment of the set. Um, and then there's surreal, which is sort of a mix in between the two. You know, this, this scene, this look here could theoretically happen. You know, you could have dark inside and light outside in the hallway, but it's, it's definitely um, exaggerated. You know, like it's a, you wouldn't really have that blue of light inside an apartment and that yellow of light outside. The point is to create a contrast, you know, maybe show how isolated they are inside their apartment versus the outside world. You know, the point is to show the emotion while still being realistic enough that it's believable um, for the most part. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of definitions of surreal, like uh, it's, it's, it's complicated, but that's in lighting generally what they mean. Um, and again, surreal can be all woven into realism. It can be woven into abstractism. You know, all these overlap a lot. And then there's symbolism, which is really similar to surrealism. Um, it's more like um, instead of trying to mimic reality with, a twist. Um, it's more like things standing in for other things. So, you know, here you have the town, which symbolizes the town, but it also symbolizes, so this is from the curious incident of the dog in the night time at uh, London, but they also symbolize other stuff throughout the play, um, and they're lit up, and there's this big screen, which is, this is light, this is projection, um, and that symbolizes all sorts of things throughout the show. Um, you sort of need to know the show to know the symbolism, but yes. So this is from the musical six, and it is definitely flashy. Um, there isn't really like a, a poetic meaning behind all these lights. It's just to look cool. Um, and I mean, that, like the colors they choose are um, symbolic, but for the most part, like, like um, all of these lights and all of these lights, there is no specific meaning behind any of them. They're just to look cool, which for some shows works really well, for some doesn't. Um, and normally this flashiness isn't the whole lighting design. There's all sorts of other stuff woven in. And fantasy. Fantasy is a little different because it's realism for fake stuff, basically. So you're trying to make a realistic world that doesn't exist. Here in Wicked, you know, everything's green. You never be in a world that's at, you never go out into the street and suddenly the skies are green, you know. Um, you, that wouldn't happen. Um, but in Wicked, in the world of Wicked, that is, that is what it is like. That's what would happen. So, you know, you're trying to create a different world. 
while making it realistic to that one world, to that same world. Um, so that's, that's it. Um, the, again, there's videos here if you want to learn anything, if and you want to see anything more in depth. Um, there's the video here on color theory if you didn't know what I was talking about then. Um, but yes.